This week on Emily Celtics Weekly, Santa must be a Bulls fan as the Celtics struggle on the road. We'll check out what it's like to be a sports writer covering the men in green. And the NBA Stay in School program continues its outreach at a Boston middle school. All this and more next on Emily Celtics Weekly. Emily Celtics Weekly brought to you by Emily Motor Oil. Better than it has to be. And now, here's your host, Mike Gorman. Hi, everybody. I'm Mike Gorman, and welcome to Emily Celtics Weekly. Well, tonight, the Celtics will wrap up their five-game road trip in Los Angeles. And for Chris Ford and the team, coming home can't come soon enough. The Celtics are now 6-8 and eight on the road, and their play this past week has been lackluster at best. The trip began Christmas night in Chicago for the Celtics, and there were no presents under the tree as they met the world champion Chicago Bulls. The Celts didn't have many leads this Christmas night, but that Reggie Lewis jump shot gave them a 10-8 bulge. However, John Paxson, not known for his defense, comes up with the block on Kevin Gamble there, and the night got worse as it went on. Scotty Pippen with that spin move to give Chicago their first lead at 17-14. Will Purdue, of all people, would have a big night. That put the Bulls up by three. And then it's Pippen again to Purdue, slashing through the lane, and the Bulls go up by five in the second. Scotty Pippen had four steals on the night. There's one that ends up in a dunk. The Bulls go up by eight. There's another one right there. Horace Grant will eventually get the basket, and the Bulls open up a 10-point lead. The Celtics came out looking like they were going to get back in this early in the third. Robert Parrish with a good defensive play there on Horace Grant. But Stacey King also would have a good night for Chicago in the middle. The Bulls up it to a 15-point lead. Kevin Gamble, nice look inside there for Robert Parrish to cut it to 13. But then B.J. Armstrong goes through the back door. The Bulls go up by 17. Again, it's B.J. Armstrong. And the lead just gets bigger as the night goes on. Armstrong would have 18 points. Pippen, another dunk right there. He had 27, and Chicago rolled. The Celtics then headed out to Seattle and looked a lot better. John Bagley to Kevin Gamble to Larry Bird. Boston a quick 6-2 lead. Ricky Pierce finds Derek McKee underneath. The Celtic lead is cut to two at that point. But then Larry Bird, a good look. Reggie Lewis, the nice hands. And the Celtics go back up by three, 22-19. Great pass coming up here by Bird. How he figured out where Lewis was, I don't know. But the Celtics go up by five. Ricky Pierce then drives, gets the layup. Celtic lead cut to one, 24-23. Benoit Benjamin would have 18 on the night. He gets a dunk right there. Eight points in the first quarter for Benoit. But then Kevin McHale, the block on Sean Kemp. Kevin would have 21, including this layup right here. And Boston led by five in the second. Ricky Pierce teed one up from outside of three. Pierce would have 26. That cut the Celtic lead to two. But Brian Shaw would find Eddie Pinckney, bad ankle and all. Six points and six rebounds for Eddie. Then Derek McKee, a pass to a cutting Ricky Pierce to cut the Celtic lead to five in the third. But Robert Parrish coming up with the interception there. And then the Chief will get the layup on the other end. The Celtics go up by seven, 68-61. Casey Jones not liking what he was seeing from Bernie Fryer. And Casey stays on the official right here and eventually gets himself tossed out of this game against the Boston Celtics. Casey not liking that at all. Larry Bird would have a big night for Boston, shooting well from the outside. He buries a three there to put the Celtics up by 15, and then Larry with three more of his 25, and the Celtics cruise over the Sonics. The good times didn't last for Boston, though. They went to Denver and played an ugly, and I mean an ugly, basketball game. Mark Macon coming up with that bad pass. And eventually it'll be Reggie Williams inside to Matombo for the dunk and the Nuggets lead early. Larry Bird drives and dishes to Robert Parrish. The Chief did have 13 on the night and that's the first Celtic basket. It came four minutes into the game. Again, a Larry Bird pass stolen. Reggie Williams gets the basket on the other end and the Nuggets go up by seven, 15 to eight. Then it's Kevin McHale who's stripped by Dikembe Matombo. Dikembe will eventually get the bucket and the Nuggets lead 19 to 10. Reggie Lewis was the only offensive hope for Boston in this one. He had 27 points. The Celtics actually had a lead at 26-25. Paris spins around Matombo for a stuff here, and Boston goes up by three. But then Marcus Liberty, one of the great names in the game, with a little spin and bank shot, and the Nuggets lead by one. Winston Garland finds Matombo, 16 points, 17 rebounds for the Worky. Larry Bird leads a four on two to get the Celtics back within two. But then a Matombo block coming up right here. One of four he had on the night leads to a Mark Macon layup. The Nuggets go up by five, 
Chris Jackson, a little give and go here, and the Nuggets would cruise in this one, 97 to 90. Well, if you check your local newspaper this morning, you find that the Celtics are now a full game behind the Knicks in the Atlantic Division. And coming up next on Amelie Celtics Weekly, we'll take a closer look at some of those people who write the stories in the newspaper and cover the Celtics all year long. We'll get to know each other. Barkley, the near steal and attempted save as he goes through the writers right into two computers. Welcome back to Emily Celtics Weekly, everyone. Did you ever wonder what it would be like to write for the sports page of a newspaper, going to every game, locker room passes, a seat at courtside? It does sound great. But don't forget, there are, well, some drawbacks to it. Deadlines, long hours, late nights, lots of traveling. Recently, we spoke to many of the sports writers who cover the Celtics to find out exactly what it is like. Most Celtic fans depend on the newspaper to get a closer look at what's going on with the team. The messengers of this information, the writers who cover the team. From their seat at courtside, each writer has to figure out how to tell the story of the game in a way that is accurate, comprehensive, and interesting. Well, I think everybody would probably agree that the, the nature of the job is changing you know, with, with, because of television and, and that people who pick up the paper in the morning are going to expect more than just what happened in the game. They're going to want a spin on it uh, as to what it you know, might mean or what it might bode. And, and I think that's you know, the responsibility that you have on it when you're doing the games. Basically, my idea, my, my job is to find out everything I can and tell that to the people that pick up the Herald every day. Um, that's essentially my job is to you know, find out stuff and tell other people. It's a real simple thing when you break it down. Was it a good game, bad game? Who played well, didn't play well? What was the tone and tenor of the game? Was it an emotional game, et cetera, et cetera? What was the crowd like? It's much, almost a theatrical look, because in the big 82, they're all not important, but some nights it's special, and if you can show the difference between the mundane and the special, I think you're doing your job. What I like to do is kind of present the player's view I mean, I do do some columns, but if I'm covering a game, I try to get the quotes. Uh, I want the, the readers to know what the players are thinking rather than what I'm thinking. I mean, some writers will have will foist their own opinions on you, but, uh, but I don't like that. Many people might be able to write an adequate game story, but few could match a beat writer's talent for writing the story under a severe deadline. I'm in a position where we have some pretty tough deadlines because we have eight editions now. So to, for me to file a first edition story, I have to file right when the game ends. How to do it, I guess after you covered 100 or so games, you, you kind of got it down. But it can be intimidating at first. Well, I don't think people do realize how difficult that is. And I know I didn't realize it when I was, I started the Globe when I was 21 years old. And the first, we call it a running story. The first time I ever do it, I thought I was going to have heart failure. I mean, it's really one of the hardest things that you have to do. You've got to keep all your statistics. You usually have to write during timeouts and at halftime. And people are coming out of stands, your neighbor or someone to say hello to you, and they don't understand why you can't talk to them. What invariably happens is I, I just keep typing and typing during timeouts or even during the game and I'm like 10 inches too long so then you gotta go back and start cutting them. I've always likened it to being like Hawkeye and Trapper especially when the, when the games start at 9 o'clock it's really it's really meatball surgery uh, and you just you, you just want to get it in the paper and make sure you, that the score is right. What you hope for always is a game whose outcome is not in doubt with 8 or 10 minutes to go and if you get that then you're home. In the case of the Boston Celtics, writers often find themselves telling stories of success. But even with this team, there are times when a reporter must be critical. I think the important thing is, uh, is to be consistent. Uh, if they played horrible, write that they played horrible. If they played well, write that they played well. Um, I've never had any difficulty with that. I, and, you know, some might say kind of surprisingly so. Uh, but people, um, players on this team here react very well. Uh, they understand that I've got a job to do. You can be critical and fair at the same time, and I think that's what most of these athletes uh, wish you would do. You know, sometimes you think you're being fair and they don't, and that's when you hear about it, and that's that's fair enough. And sometimes they have valid points. I think the one thing we, we tend to forget sometimes is they are human beings, so I try to stay away from making fun of someone's appearance or things like that. Uh, but when it comes to their game, uh, that's our job, and it's not always the most pleasant part of the job, but it certainly is part of it. Daily stories are nice, but what many fans really look forward to are the Sunday NBA notes columns. Filled with newsy items from around the league, the notes columns are a pleasure to read and a big job to write. 
The way you do it is you devote your, all your energy, 24, you know, literally uh, you, all your waking moments towards looking out for notes and stockpiling notes and keeping a, a log during the course of the week and trying to think about everything that you come in contact with in an NBA sense in terms of how that may translate into a note. And then beyond, all along the way, you have to cultivate sources and people you can always go back to. But I mean, it's, it's a constant thought process. It's kind of like you establish a running game by thinking running game 100% of the time. You establish a notebook mode by thinking notebook mode 100 percent of your working time it's my favorite part of the job because i think it is the thing that's most widely read uh what i do is i'm on the phones all week long you can't we i have one day that's designated for me to do that work but that's impossible if you count on that one day you're gonna have a lousy calm so all week long uh, before a game when you could be just sitting around relaxing you're talking to players and athletes you're calling people in hotels you're talking to general managers and my seventh year doing this so uh on the day i gather notes generally on thursday I'll, i get a lot of phone calls as well you become Kind of an kind of an information broker. People around the league, uh, you know, sometimes people in front offices will call about certain things. They'll want to know what's going on with a certain player in the Eastern Conference. They maybe will tell you something else, give you a little piece of information that leads you somewhere else. And it's it's kind of a real strange thing. But I, I'm trying to describe it. You know, maybe like taking a huge thing of uh, clay and, and like molding it and uh, not knowing where the hell it's going half the time. When asked what most fans don't understand about their jobs, most writers are in agreement. Don't blame them for the big type. I think the number one thing that they misunderstand about our job is that we do not write headlines. We don't write the headlines, so don't, us, don't hold us responsible for that. I, I wish people would, would not think that. I mean, you know, sometimes headlines just drive me crazy, too. But, uh, you know, plus they think it's an easy job. Uh, I, I don't want to toot my own horn or anything, but this is not an easy job. It's really a pain sometimes. Uh, it's a lot of late nights, long days, a lot of traveling, things like that. It's really not as much fun as they think. Most of us here are, are working pretty hard, you know. We do enjoy it, and it's a different kind of job, but... Um, it's also a lot of work, too. Believe me, after 10 years of watching those folks up close, it is indeed a difficult job. The NBA Stay in School program continues to influence youngsters all over the country. Recently, some of the Celtics teamed up with eight-time NBA All-Star Bob Lanier in Dorchester to talk about the word pride. We have all that and more when Emily Celtics Weekly continues. Tucks the way they're spreading out the floor again. Now they go Lanier this trip, two. Well, it was three seconds that time. Lanier never got out of there. Nine points for Big Bob. Ainge can't answer. Bridgman the boards. Up ahead on the break. Marcus by himself. Tracks it down on the cut, Lanier. Two and a foul. For the past couple of weeks, we've been bringing you stories of NBA players talking about the importance of education to kids in the Boston area. Well, recently, former NBA great Bob Lanier came to Boston and with some friends tried to send a message of pride to students at the Woodrow Wilson Middle School in Dorchester. In conjunction with the Boston Celtics, the National Basketball Association, and all the fine students and staff here at the Woodrow Wilson School, it's bring on some people we're going to tell you all about staying in school. And I can think of no one bigger and better to do it than the chairman of this program that the NBA has adopted, and Mr. Bob Lanier. I know y'all saying, boy, that's a big man, isn't it? It's important for y'all to realize that we want y'all to be successful, and we want to stress education and encouraging you people to stay in school today. We're going to spell out the word pride. How do you spell pride? P-R-I-D-E. Correct. P-R-I-D-E. And I will take the first letter P, which stands for positive mental attitude. Now, if I give you the letter, I want you to repeat the letter and clap twice with enthusiasm, okay? First letter is P. P. No, energetic. I want enthusiasm like P. You know what I'm saying? Okay, first letter is P. P. We kind, we kind of slow up. Somebody help me out. What's your name? Jonathan. Jonathan. Okay. First name is Pete. Pete. Yeah, I like that. Okay. Okay, you're the leader of this group right here. Everybody in this whole group. First name is Pete. Pete. No, y'all sleep. First name is Pete. Pete. Over here. First name is Pete. Pete. I like that. First name is Pete. Pete. We thought if we could bring the resources of the NBA 
to the schools and try and give them some support in terms of the program, stay in school, try to focus on attendance, bringing students' whole attitude up, you can help make a difference. Now, the first letter P stands for positive mental attitude. Understanding that you must believe in yourself in order to be successful in life. When I was way back a long time ago, when I was 12 years old, and I was wearing a size 12 sneaker, and then I got to be 13, and I wore a size 13 sneaker. And now I'm like 28, and I wear a 22 sneaker. But I didn't feel good about who I was at the time, because young people used to tease me about my feet, saying, boy, you got big feet and you're clumsy. And I used to walk around with my head down. I didn't feel good about who Bob Lanier was. Speaking with experts in education, you know, talking about self-esteem, about respect, making intelligent choices, about goal setting, and working hard in educational process contributes to somebody being successful. And those are the critical issues that we talk about with middle schools. I tell myself a lot of positive things, and I started feeling good about who I was. And that's the same thing that you gotta do. It doesn't matter if you got real nappy hair like this. It don't matter. Or if you got real big nose like this, it don't matter. You gotta feel good about who you are when you look in that mirror. Okay, the second letter is R. Okay, let's say, okay, let's do it, R. Again, R. See, I'm having you do this because it's been a long time since I played basketball, and I like the noise. I miss all the noise of playing in front of a big crowd. This is great. R. Okay. Many of us have been doing things for the um, last four, five, six months, especially just working on this particular program and making the team of the, the NBA and the Celtics the school system and the sports museum and in that team it, it really seems like it's clicking you know so it's a yeah you do a lot of work and you say hey this is what it's all about the first letter stood for positive mental attitude second letter i stood for respect third letter i which will be brought to you by kevin McHale, will stand for intelligent choices big hand for mr kevin McHale. Thank you. Before I, get in, before I get into my intelligent choices, I'll tell you a little story about Bob. It was one of my first games in the NBA, and I was playing against Bob, and I was feeling pretty good. I was a young Colt. Bob was a little bit older than I was. And I was elbowing him a fight. Next thing I know, he grabbed me around my neck, started liquor dragging me around the court. I said, OK, Mr. Lanier, I'll be nice. Finally, let me go. He dang near killed me, man. I thought, boy, this NBA is a tough way to make a buck. Every NBA city, we try to have a retired player along with a current player to help in the process of trying to touch young kids' lives and trying to make a difference in their community. Uh, and we've been fortunate, and I think the NBA is fortunate that you have a lot of people who have played or are part of the NBA that care about the process of young kids being better and being successful and understanding that they are our future. And the more we can do with them now just enhances the future for everybody. One of us. You've got to make an intelligent choice. You know, you just don't do things because everybody else does them. Do you? You know, if all your friends are doing something that's wrong, it's so easy to do it, isn't it? All your friends are doing something that's wrong, and rather than be the one person who says, "No, I'm not going to do that," I'm just going to go along with them. You know? You know what those people are doing right now? Half those people are in jail telling the judge, "I was just there. I didn't. Hey, I don't know what happened. I just happened to be walking along with the rest of the guys." because they didn't make an intelligent choice. Bob asked me to speak on dreams, and I like that, because there was another ML that spoke about dreams. A guy by the name of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. He taught us how to dream. He taught us that it wasn't a bad thing to dream. He taught us that we should dream. When I was in elementary and junior high school, I was the, the smallest, the skinniest kid you know, in my class. And my father is about 6'3", about 285, 290 pounds. Real, real big man. And when he would raise his voice, I would just cringe up and start crying. And when I didn't show any effort in my education, I didn't do my homework, I didn't hit the books the way I was supposed to hit my books, 
My father would come home from work and he would take off his big leather belt <laughs> and he would whoop my behind. So what we're talking about today and all the examples that we're using and that we're telling you, we want that to serve as your big leather belt so that when you go home, you don't have to get it from your mother or father. I thought it was a very special type of presentation in that the athletes didn't preach at the youngsters about staying in school, but they shared about some of their own personal experiences and the students could relate to that. Uh, the NBA has put together a wonderful program for youngsters across the country and I think it's uh, a fantastic idea to use athletes to bring that message to young people. They do have a strong influence over, I think, all of our young people today. Great work being done off the court by those players and former players. And Bob Lanier really does have those big feet he talked about. They actually are a size 22, and a bronzed pair of his sneakers are on display at the Basketball Hall of Fame up in Springfield, Massachusetts. And speaking of the Hall of Fame, December marks the 100th anniversary of the game of basketball. And we'll take a glimpse at the Hall next on Emily Celtics Weekly. When you get inducted into the Hall of Fame, it's something that, uh, as you're growing up, I don't think you think about it. But as time passes and your career progresses, it's the ultimate. The sport of basketball has evolved from peach baskets and wool uniforms to breakaway rims and nylon in its century of growth. The greatest chronicle of the game's evolution and tribute to the greats who have been involved with it is the Nesmith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame in Springfield, Massachusetts. 100 years ago, in 1891, in Springfield, Massachusetts, Dr. James Nesmith, an instructor at the local YMCA, created the game of basketball. On February 16, 1968, in tribute to Dr. Nesmith, the Nesmith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame was created at Springfield College. In 1985, the Hall of Fame moved to its current site on the banks of the Connecticut River. The Hall of Fame houses memorabilia from high school, college, Olympic, and professional basketball. Most importantly, it honors and enshrines the greats from all worlds of basketball. Players, coaches, teams, and contributors. Induction into the Hall of Fame is the ultimate honor. It's the pinnacle of success. It recognizes people for greatness, hard work, and perseverance. The first induction was in 1959. There were 17 inductees, eight contributors, four players, two coaches, two teams, and a referee. This year, the class of 1991 had seven inductees, also spanning many facets of the game. The 33rd induction honored two contributors, the late Larry Fleischer and the late Larry O'Brien, three players, Harry Gallatin, Nate Tiny Archibald, and Dave Collins. One coach, Bobby Knight, and the first person elected from the International Committee, contributor Boris Stankovic. The Hall of Fame is a great place to visit. With names like Red Auerbach, Bill Russell, Will Chamberlain, and Pete Maravich in the Honors Court, enshrinement really is quite an honor. The nominees for induction in 1992 are as follows. Look at the great names up there. Luke Conasecca, the great coach at St. John's, and Bob Lanier, who we just saw, still doing great work with the Stay in School program. Al McGuire, Calvin Murphy, Jack Ramsey, and the list just continues to go on as the Hall of Fame will continue to be a great place. The Celtics have one more road game before heading home. However, this week, they have another of those back-to-backers on Friday night at home and then Saturday night on the road. Let's take a look at the Celtics' schedule. Again tonight, they take on the Los Angeles Clippers out in L.A. Then the Celtics will get back on a plane and head home for the New Year's holiday and a date with the Cleveland Cavaliers. That's coming up on Friday night. And then back they go out to the Midwest to see Jimmy Rogers and his Minnesota Timberwolf Club for the first time this year. That'll do it for this week's version of Amelie Celtics Weekly. Hope you've enjoyed the last half hour. See you next week, everybody. Amelie Celtics Weekly, brought to you by Amelie Motor Oil.